This is a derivative. This is also a derivative. And so is this expression. A differential equation is essentially just a bunch of derivatives and functions put together into one large equation. We define an ordinary differential equation to be some differential equation where the dependent term y depends on one independent term x. A partial differential equation, on the other hand, may have one independent variable dependent on two or even more dependent variables. We can also describe differential equations through their order, kind of like a polynomial, where we look at the highest derivative and we can call it some nth order differential equation. There is a special class of differential equations called linear differential equations, where essentially every y term is by itself and the term before it only depends on x. The solution to a differential equation is just going to be some function. Similar to how polynomials, we substitute a value for x to make sure 0 equals to 0. We could do the same thing with a function, plugging it back in, taking the derivatives, and still double checking that 0 equals to 0. However, there can be multiple solutions to a differential equation, so a slope field is a very nice way to visualize what the solutions look like. What you do is plug in some specific point, calculate what the derivative is at that point, and just draw the slope. If the value is 0, then the line should be horizontal. If the value is positive, it should go up. And if the value is negative, then it should go down. Then, all we need to do is draw lines that follows the different slopes and we get to see what the different solutions look like. Sometimes we're also given an initial condition, some specific point that the function has to go through, which we can then draw a line that passes through that point. Autonomous differential equations are really interesting because the derivative does not depend on x at all. What this means is that we can find specific ranges of y where we directly know whether the slope is positive or negative. Hence, we can directly split the direction field into different sections where we know solutions will increase or decrease. Therefore, drawing solutions is extremely easy. So the question becomes, how do you solve a differential equation? Let's start with first order differential equations, and there's already several different types of them. So let's start with separable equations, where we can directly split the x and y terms into some products. For this example, we move all of the y terms to one side, and all of the x terms to one side, and integrate them separately, not forgetting the integrating factor. Moving terms around, we get our final solution, which will be related to the integrating factor. We can solve for that integrating factor if we're given some sort of initial condition, as mentioned earlier. Onto linear equations, which we know have to have this form, as mentioned earlier, and if we divide a1 of x on both sides, we get this really nice form. What we do with linear equations is we first solve for something called the integrating factor, which is e to the power of the integral of p of x. The reason we do this is because this gives us a really nice expression where we can directly integrate f of x with the integrating factor and that gives us something closely related to y. Exact equations have to follow a very specific form where the partial of m with respect to y is the same as the partial of n with respect to x. Now solving exact equations is a really specific process. You assume that there is some solution that depends on both x and y, and the idea is that taking the derivative of f with respect to x gives you m, and the derivative with respect to y gives you n. So all you need to do is solve for f of x and y by taking one of the m or n's, integrating it, knowing that it has lost one of the terms due to taking the derivative, and then solving for f of x and y, and setting it to zero. 
Now, the reason differential equations are so popular is because all you need to do is say something like the change of a population is directly proportional to the population itself and you can get an explicit solution. A solution that looks like a population that you might expect to grow or decay. Newton's law basically says that the temperature of a specific object will change directly proportional to the difference between the temperature of the object and the surrounding temperature. And the solutions do look like temperatures that we expect to see. Another very popular differential equation is called logistic growth, where the change in population not only depends on the population itself, but also how close it is to the carrying capacity. So the graph looks like something we would expect for some population where there is a limit on how high the population can go. Now let's get to higher order differential equations, which are a bit trickier to solve, so let's make it a bit simpler by making the right hand side equal to zero. These equations are called homogeneous equations, and they have some really nice properties. For one, if you have a list of solutions to these equations, their linear combination is also a solution. Another fact we should know is that if we can't find coefficients where solutions can cancel each other, we call them linearly independent, kind of like linear algebra. Furthermore, an nth order homogeneous differential equation has to have exactly n linearly independent solutions. So putting all of these together, we get that the general solution for a homogeneous differential equation has to be a linear combination of these independent solutions. Now showing independence is going to be a little bit different compared to linear algebra because we're dealing with functions, but one nice thing that we have is called Dorotskian, which is essentially a matrix, except every row is a derivative of the row above. And if Dorotskian is non-zero for any x, then we know that these functions are dependent. Here we see two really nice examples where one never equals to zero and the other always equals to zero. Now, let's solve a really easy example of homogeneous linear equations, constant coefficients. Every single term in front of a y has to be some specific number. All you need to do is transfer it to its auxiliary equation, where every single derivative just becomes a power in a polynomial. You solve for the roots, and depending on what the roots are, there is really a specific formula for a general solution that you can just plug it back in. Notice that each solution has two different terms, and we can verify that they are independent. And since there are two of them, they have to form the general solution. Notice that all we need to do now is do a bunch of algebra, solve for the roots, and just plug it back into the formula. The constants can then be solved through a system of equations with two different initial conditions. Now let's say we don't have a zero on the right hand side, we do have something non-homogeneous. What do we do? Well, if we do have the solution to the homogeneous solution, where we know it's some sort of linear combination which can equal to zero, if we just add that solution that solves for the specific g of x at the end, that combination will also be a solution. Now, there are two main ways to solve for this particular solution. You either use the method of undetermined coefficients or you use Laplace transforms. Let's start with the method of undetermined coefficients which is kind of just guessing. You're essentially guessing what the form of the particular solution is such that it matches the right hand side. If the right hand side is some sort of polynomial with degree two, then you guess some polynomial of degree two. If the right hand side is some sort of exponential, then you guess some form of exponential. If the right hand side has some sines or cosines, then you guess that it has to have sines and cosines because, well, derivatives can switch to sines and cosines back and forth. If your guess ever matches the complementary solution, then go up by a factor of x because you're just gonna get the homogeneous solution again. Now, let's walk through an example. We know how to find the complementary solution. Find the auxiliary equation, find the roots, and we're done. Now we try to guess the particular solution. We first guess that it has to have some sort of e to the x. 
but it's already in a complementary solution, so we guess x e to the x, which is also part of the complementary solution, so we go up even more, we guess x squared e to the x. So all we have to do is solve for the coefficient in front of this term, and that gives us our particular solution, and together, that gives us our general solution. Another method, which is probably a more rigorous method, is the Laplace transform, which by definition is just some transformation where you put in a function and you get out another function. And the Laplace transform has a really nice linearity property. And what we can do is apply the Laplace transform to the entire differential equation so it is in its Laplace transform form, and then do some algebraic manipulation because it will no longer have derivatives to get some solution and then translate it back. This will make more sense once we look at an example, but first, here are some really common Laplace transforms you might see on the first or last page on a differential equation textbook. So what you would do is look at the table rather than do an integral again and again. Let's go through an example. We are given a differential equation, we are given the initial conditions, which is something we need to have for the Laplace transform. What we do is take the Laplace on both sides, use the linearity property to simplify it, move things to the left hand side, move things to the right hand side, and what we get is one single expression purely dependent on s. We then use some algebraic techniques to simplify this complicated expression to more simple fractions because once we have these simpler fractions, we can look at the table again to translate them back to the functions where they came from. And using that, we get our final solution. Now that we know how to solve higher order differential equations, let's go through another very common math modeling example. We have some mass spring system, some block connected to a spring, we can stretch it outwards, release it, it'll move back and forth. How do we model this? using differential equations. Physics tells us that there's a force pulling forward, which is f equals to ma, as well as the force of the spring pulling it back, which depends on the spring constant. So this immediately gives us a differential equation. Now let's make it a bit more complicated. Let's say it was on a ground which actually has friction. So in addition to the current forces, there's also friction that is pulling it back. So all we need to do is modify the differential equation to add another force where friction depends on the velocity, which is the first derivative of x. Now, depending on how much friction there is, the spring will move in very different ways, which you might expect, but there is a very mathematical way to show how this works. So we will split this into four main damping cases. Whether there is no friction, a little bit of friction, quote unquote the perfect amount of friction, or too much friction. Notice that once friction is involved, we have some decaying term at the front, which makes sense. The spring will stop over time. But once we have too much friction, there's no longer a sine or cosine. The spring just doesn't move back and forth anymore. And we can see a nice visualization of this as well, which is really nice. Now, let's talk about linear systems, where you have two dependent variables on one independent variable, so you do have a system of equations. If we have constant coefficient linear systems, we can write this in matrix form, which is extremely clean. Just as a quick reminder, because we will need this later, in order to calculate eigenvalues, you need to calculate the determinant of a minus lambda i, and then you solve for the eigenvectors by finding the v's that makes it zero. Now, kind of similar to the second order differential equations, depending on what eigenvalues we get, they will give different solutions, and it's the same process as before. Solve for the eigenvalues, solve for the eigenvectors, plug them into the final solution. Just like we did before, let's look at some examples. The process is the exact same. You're given a matrix, you're gonna solve the eigenvalues, it's gonna fall into one of the three different cases, you're going to plug them back in to solve for the eigenvectors and together to give you the final solutions. Now what's interesting is that these different eigenvalues when plotted also look extremely different and typically we can also classify them by their stability. Just as a quick example, let's say that the eigenvalues are negative. 
Well, the general solution tells us that everything will converge to zero over time, but what does the graph look like? Well, the graph looks like the same thing. A bunch of different lines all going towards the origin, which we call a stable node. Now what if the eigenvalues are positive? Well, all the solutions will be going outwards and hence we create an unstable node. Now what happens if one eigenvalue is positive and the other is negative? Well, one vector is going to go to zero and the other vector is going to go to infinity. And this is what we see in the graph as well. All of the lines kind of following this horizontal line to infinity. Now let's consider the case where we have complex eigenvalues. Well, we know the alpha term kind of tells the graph to go inwards or outwards, and the beta term, since it becomes cosines and sines, just becomes a circle. So if alpha is negative, we have a stable spiral, all the solutions circling inwards. If alpha is positive, on the other hand, then the solutions will be circling outwards. If alpha is zero, then all we have are the sine and cosine terms, so the solutions will just go in circles. In the natural world, however, a lot of differential equations don't have these nice explicit solutions, so we need ways to estimate the real solutions. One method is called Euler's method, where using the definition of derivative, what we do is essentially start at some initial point and take small steps according to the derivative to hopefully approximate the answer at the end. Let's go over an example. Let's say there's this differential equation, we're given the initial condition, and we want to approximate the value at like y of 0.2 for example, h is our step size. What we essentially do is step forward one at a time using the derivative to see how much we step upwards to approximate our final solution. And what we realize is that we're not that far off from what the actual answer is. One thing that people in numerical methods love doing is error analysis, essentially seeing how well this method actually works, which we can actually prove using Taylor's expansion. Using the expansion, comparing it to what we actually are using, we realize that each step, we make an error that's of the size h squared. So after n steps, we get an error that is directly proportional to our step size. This is already pretty good. If our step size is 1 over 1000, then we expect the error to be around some factor of 1 over 1000. But we can do even better, called the runge kuda method. There's a lot of different variations of it, I'm just going to go over the fourth order version, where essentially you do a bunch of algebra to get four different variables and use those to calculate the next step. Using this method, we can show that the accuracy is much better. If h is 1 tenth, then h to the fourth is 1 in 10 thousandth. In this video, we covered a lot of things regarding differential equations. We speed ran a lot of them, we kind of introduced some methods. Obviously, this isn't going to cover everything in a regular differential equations course, but hopefully this gave you a general idea of what you might expect when taking such a course in your undergrad career.